The church is one foundation. Stay in the scene with us.
It's for the children.
on the good note, uh, we've been praying for uh, for Jane Martin, and she was home this afternoon. That was a very quick recovery. So the prayer does work because she what was it, two weeks maybe two weeks wasn't long. So she really has to be home. I'm sure she is. So she will continue to pray for her as she continues to uh, as she continues to heal the first time. Any others? Anybody at all? Heavenly Father, we come into your house today. It's a very old facility, very old building, with some very rich history. A temple built for you, God, to worship you, to show you our great love for you, to acknowledge you as the great creator of all things, to know you as our Father in heaven, to recognize that we are your children. So much history, so many memories here, God. Weddings, funerals, baptisms, celebrations, and mourning. All has happened in this house. And God, we thank you today for the blessings you've always had on this church. In times of trouble where the church struggled, in times of great celebration where it flourished. But in all things that happen in this house, God, you have always been there with us. You have always been there for us. The many thousands of prayers that have been answered and asked in this place. It's, it's just incredible what you do for us. It's just incredible how much you love us. And it's never ended. And, and we, we, we fail to stop and to just acknowledge that. That you are that powerful and you are that great and you are that wonderful. That you love us that much. It's hard sometimes, most times, God, to even try to understand a love that great because we're not capable of returning. We fail you, God, in many, in many ways. We don't seek you in, in the ways that we should, the, the holiness, the great love that you give us has never returned in that, in that amount. Yet as we stop and see even in the grief, God, we see you even in the times where we didn't think there was any hope on the other side, we see you and acknowledge that there is always hope. The many times, God, that we, we've been so afraid, yet you were there and you made everything work again. You renewed everything. New mercies every morning, God. New mercies every day. And still we we fail to live up to what you would have us do. Forgive us for what we thought. For being the humans that we are. Help us, God, to reach to you and to seek you in everything we do in our every day, every morning, every evening. Help us seek you, to seek your guidance, to seek your Seek your faith in us. Help us, God, to have that same faith in you. For all these that have been lifted up this morning, God, for both healing and grief, we ask you to, be, to strengthen us, to continue to heal us, continue to lead us. And for this great worship, God, for this great fellowship, these saints that come into this church, in all other churches, God, we ask that you continue to bless our churches and bless our people. Bless us, God. Help us to grow, but help us more than anything to always serve outside these walls. 
and to always be available and conscious to know where that stuff is wrong. God, we lift these things up to you this morning and pray as you have taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thou kingdom come, thou will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. May the Lord us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Let us continue worshiping to the giving of our tithes and all. No. Oh, I don't know. Wait a minute.
Men and women both will appreciate this story. But on two sides of the story, you'll appreciate it. Man come home one day and found his wife was there in the dress looking in a full length mirror.
said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and it filled the trench also with water. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God of Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that these people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell on him, consumed the burnt offering, and the wood and the stones went to dust, and he lifted up all the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of the Kishon and slaughtered them. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, may these words come from you through me and into the ears of those who listen to hear. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now at the end of this, we find Elijah on the run. Elijah's running for his life. He's on the run, not because of a horrible failure but because of the spectacular success of what he just did. God has sent Elijah to Ahab in an effort to bring the people back to him. There had been an incredible drought, and the land was perishing, all because of their worship of Baal. But Elijah is not heard, but is challenged. Challenged that their God is better than his God. So Elijah says, gather your 450 prophets together. I'll be there. We'll set up two altars. Bring some wood. Everything that's needed. And a bowl for each of us. We won't light that fire. We'll let our gods light that fire. That seems fair enough, did it not? So they gathered early in the morning. They did as Elijah said. And he said, you go first. That's the thing. See, because he knows that his God is the real God and his God is going to come through for him. He has the faith enough to know before this even starts that God is God and I don't have to fear a thing. So he says, you go first. They danced and they pranced and they cut themselves as they practiced their habits. They did everything that was necessary to call down Paul to ignite the sacrificial altar of wood. But nothing happened. Nine o'clock came, ten o'clock. They were getting bloody by this time, even 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock. By this time, Elijah decides to mock them. And he says things like, I think your God is out to lunch. It's not working, is it? Well, let's just give it a little more time. They take a little more time. They get the frenzy going. Everything is in motion except the fire. The fire doesn't come. By 3 o'clock. Elijah says, I think you've had all the time that you need. And this thing going to happen. So he puts his bull on the altar. He places the wood on the altar. Puts the trench around it. Fills it full of jars of water. Just to make sure that they get the point. Fire doesn't start on wet wood. And a trench of water. Then Elijah said to the people, those 450 prophets, I don't think we need them anymore. So they killed them. It's a true story. Here to read it, it's in the book. That's the one I tell you to read every week. Did you read it this past week? God, I don't want to ask y'all to raise your hand for going to tell us in the church, so I won't do it. word soon gets to Jezebel. This is where the problem starts. Queen Jezebel is the daughter of Ethbal, king of Sidon, and the wife of Ahab, the king of Israel. And Jezebel promoted the worship of idols and false gods. She harassed and killed God's prophets. 
She even executed one time a completely innocent man. She's furious. She said, I can't believe it. She said to her messenger, you take this message to Eliza, tell him within 24 hours he's going to be as dead as they are. So Elijah makes his way to a cave to hide. He's terrified. He waits for the Lord to speak to him. So Elijah is on the run. He runs at least one day away. He wants to run further. But he's exhausted and tired. He sits under a broom tree and begins to pray. And he said, oh Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And now that's a strange thing to say for a man that's running for his life. <coughs> He's run all that way for his life, and now he wants to die. Not really so strange if you think about some things you've been through in your life, where you wanted to live and you wanted to change it, you wanted it to be better, but you got to the point where I was just, I just, it's not going to happen. Just, hey, I can't stand it anymore. So he's running for his life Jezebel wants him dead. He is running so he can stay alive. So he gets tired, pops under a tree, and says, take my life. Just a little further on, he's going to say, he's the only righteous one left. But right now, he says, then he says, I'm worthless. I'm no better than my ancestors. So which is it? Uh, he's a little confused. He finds his way to He's worried, he's nervous, he's scared to death. He's waiting, waiting, and waiting for the Lord to speak to him. And he listens, and nothing happens. And up to this point, everything that Elijah has done, every decision he has made, has come directly from God himself. And he has done exactly as God has directed him. But now he finds himself hiding in a cave because he did what God told him to. And now he fears for his life. And he has nowhere to go. So God, where are you? And a few things happened while he was in that cave. The first thing was a great big wind came and stirred around Elijah. And he went to the entrance of the cave to watch the wind. He said, this is it. This is it. The Lord is going to speak here and going to be manifest. It's going to be a manifestation of God in a, in a Hebrew tradition. It's going to happen. And it didn't happen. Then all of a sudden there is an earthquake. Elijah said, this is it. God will speak. But God did come and God didn't speak. Then a raging fire comes by and he says, this one is it, finally. The third time is a charm. Nothing happens but the fire goes out. And we know what that's like. If we dig back in our, even if we're young enough, we can dig back at a time when we were terrified, scared, and didn't know what was going to happen next and didn't know where to go. And we're waiting on the word. What God do I do? Because we stand here and we preach to you that during the times of your life when you're down and when you can't see hope, you get on your knees and you pray to God because he's going to deliver you out of it. So we get on our knees and we pray to God and we don't hear anything. Anybody who's ever followed the Gospels and knows anything about the Gospel has to wait on the Word sometimes. That seems most obvious. And ought to speak of God's will in our lives don't seem to do the trick. We wait for that voice, but sometimes it just doesn't come. Time and time again we think we've seen it, but each time we realize we were wrong. Now, if you're a preacher, you understand this cave analogy. Because it happens to me every week back in that office. Some of you know this because you drop in at the office, and I tell you that this is happening to me. It's early in the week, you sit down and you think about next Sunday's sermon every Monday morning. Y'all think I come up with this on Saturday night. I don't. It takes me a week. So I start on Monday. As you know, I don't do sermons ahead of time. I really don't. I really believe that God's going to give me what he wants me to say on Sunday morning, and I sit and I wait for it. So it's early in the week, and I sit down at that desk, 
And I start thinking about next Sunday. And I hope I get this message early in the week. I will tell David. I want my sermon done by Wednesday. Jessica, will call, Jessica and Kim will call and they say, if you could give it to us early. So I don't think we're telling you. So you say, well, Sunday's coming. I've got to do something. And it's incredible how dark that office can get in the middle of the day. It's as though there is a power failure in the universe because everything is dark in that cave. And God is absent. And you have nothing. I don't like the dark. I'm afraid of the dark. The dark scares me very badly. <coughs> I don't know what's in the dark. And I don't want to know what's in the dark. And that's what scares me is what might be in the dark that I don't know is there. Sometimes in the dark in the middle of the night, <coughs> I'll hear Debbie say, Did you hear that? <laughs> Brown said, what matters are not the words because what is important to communicate is that is that which is not containable in words. You must find the best words you can find and gesture toward the orphan. That's what he tells preachers to do. I don't understand it, so I can't do it. So the real issue in preaching is not learning necessarily how to talk, but it's learning how to listen, which is consistently taught. For Elijah, in the midst of the darkness of the cave, God finally whispers, listen to this because it scares me some. That's exactly what happened to Elijah. In the midst of the darkness of the cave came a voice. The voice came up. Listen, people. The voice came up close to his ear. Right here. And it said, what are you doing? That's worse than the dark came. <laughs> Even though you know it's the almighty God is not going to hurt you. But to have a voice in a cave, after all the things that he's seen, to have a voice in a cave come right next to your ear when you're supposed to be the only one in there and say it. Notice he didn't say what he's doing there. People listen. Listen to this close. 
change your attitude about God and do what I'm about to tell you. He didn't say, what are you doing there? He didn't say, what are you doing there? He never mentioned that he was in one place and you were in another. He said, what are you doing here? Meaning that God was in that cave. God was standing right next to Elijah. God isn't where you think he is. He's not far off. He's right here. And he walks among you. And he walks beside you. And each and every time you go through something and you can't find him, look, because he's right next to you. He's right next to your ear. Which is why you can't hear him. You're looking in the wrong places, finding the wrong things, expecting the wrong answers. You're not wanting an answer from God. You're wanting God to answer you. There's a difference there. Because if God answers you, he gives you the answer you want. And if you're looking for an answer from God, he's going to give you the answer he wants you to have. And he tells Elijah, why are you here? In other words, why are you running? After all I just showed you, after all we just did, why are you here hiding? What are you hiding for? Speaking of the dark, you know, God is the dark. You know who created the dark? God created the dark. God's bigger than the dark. It's God's dark. The promise is that God will be present. Later on, Jesus will tell us in the Gospels, he'll say, Lo, I am with you always. I think he meant, I am with you inside caves. He didn't mean, I am with you then, but I am with you now. I'm with you not there, but I'm with you here in the dark. With you in the dark. While you're in the dark, I'm whispering in your ear. With the confidence of children, the most high God revealed in Christ that we may dare to endure the dark. We can trust the dark because God is the dark. It's God's dark. At God's good pleasure, you'll hear the voice when he's ready for you to hear it. And he'll hear what he has to tell you, not what you're looking for. It may be still, it may be small, it may be louder than that. It may say, Adam, where are you? Or it may be a very kind voice. The kind you hear in a cave in the dark. Or it may actually be, who touched the hem of my garment? In whatever form God speaks to you, where it's loud, soft, short, long, the voice will come. No matter what you're facing, listen, no matter what your dark is, no matter what you're going through, no matter what's happening in your life, no matter your losses, no matter your fears, no matter anything that's going on that's knocked you off your foundation, listen to God because he's whispering in your ear and you're not hearing it. Open up to God and hear what he whispers in your ear. God will answer you. You may feel betrayed and alone sometimes. I have. I've been there with you. You feel orphaned, destroyed, and hopeless for the future. You see absolutely no glimmer of hope in that darkness. Nothing can ever be the same again. Listen, God is not far from you. God is not in a faraway planet. God is not in a faraway place. God created where you're at. God created. You're still in the dark being of evil. It just looks different. And God still walks among these hills, among these plains. He still moves those mountains. Don't look for God up there. Look for God right here, right next to you, right to your right. Your right is on God. Everybody else is on your left. But your right hand is reserved for the Almighty. And he whispers in your ear, you just got to listen. And prepare, be prepared to hear what he will say. And he will say, I am here. Let us pray.
Gracious Holy Father, thank you for being here. Help us to understand that we need to get a different view of you and understand you in a different way, that you're not far off. You're right here, God, and because you're right here, we can endure anything, including the darkness, the darkness in our world, and all the things that the devil in the world can throw at us. You will make right again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um,
Jane, just make me a plate. Man, will you make me a plate? Don't give nobody that soon. Put that long.